Hello everyone, my name is Nathalie Maubon. I am a senior scientist in biology. I have worked more than 12 years in pharmaceutical industries and now I have launched HCS Pharma uh, seven years ago in order to improve the drug discovery process and I will explain how and why uh, we can do, to, we can improve the drug discovery process. For that I will explain you what is the history, what we do today and what is the future to find new treatments for human health and how Biomesis, a new and breakthrough technology, can help to find new drugs and new treatments for, for, human, for human health. So I will start with the healthcare, what is the past, present and the future. So previously, until the 19th century, it's the age of botany. Uh, all plants that we want to use are directly tested to humans. At the beginning of the 19th century, we have the, the development of the chemistry and the, the, the beginning of the purification of active ingredients from the plants. And so, with the chemistry, we start to, to, to work with small molecules uh, derived from the chemistry. So we start to work on humans, but even during the fact that the active ingredients are purified, the toxicity was higher when you test that on humans. It's because of that they started to use, to, to test active ingredients into animals and small molecules into animals. After the, after the war, we, uh, we start to have the molecular and cellular biology help us to test drugs, not on directly on animals, but on tissues. After that, we have the chemical assays. We have started to automatize. And finally, we, we have a lot of uh, uh, possibilities to test drugs directly on targets. So at the end of the 19th uh, uh, century, we start to, to have the, that we call tar target-based screening, so high throughput screening on transfected cells or on biochemistry, um, biochemistry uh, assays. So the big issue is that when we start to test a library, a large library of compounds, directly on targets. We, we, the active uh, drugs are then tested on cells, after that on animals, and the, uh, the drug candidates arrive in clinical trials, and at the end, we have only 10% of success in clinical trials. So it's a long process with really high failure rates. We start to see the, the efficiency of this target-based screening but we can see that we have a lot of expenditure with this technology. And finally, for, for a, a decrease of the number of drugs approved by the FDA. So we can see that we have a, a decrease of the research and development productivity to find new drugs. The big issue is that if you work on target based screening, the hypothesis is one disease, one defective proteins that we call targets. We know that we have 30,000 diseases listed on human. So we need at the least a minimum of uh, 30,000 proteins. So the hypothesis is the number of estimated genes was around 100,000 uh, genes. So at the end of the 19th century, uh, we have the Human Genome Project to sequence all the human genome. And after that, we have an ENCODE project to determine the percentage of coding and non-coding genes in order to see the number of proteins that we can have in the human cells. And finally, with the, these two projects, we can see that we have only 22,000 coding genes, giving around 22,000 proteins. So this first hypothesis, one disease, one defective proteins, is really false. It's because of that, the target-based screening is totally inefficient. We can see also that uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, we have around um, more than 1,000 FDA-approved FDA drugs and more than 3,000 uh, 3, experimental drugs. Finally, for only 394 targets for the 30 uh, thousand disease listed on humans. So we have few targets available and known for drug screening 
and that we can see also when we when you are, you, you do knockout experiment on mouse knockout of one target we have compensation effects so we have several proteins with same activity so meaning that you have a high level of reg regulation for the tra transcription of the gene and we have a complex interaction network so we have more than 90-80% of non-coding genes. It's because of that, at the beginning of the 20th century, we have started to implement what we call phenotypic screening. Instead of going to the targets, we start to, to work on, 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 on cellular models. We try to develop cellular models that recreate uh, disease models in order to find new drugs. That we can see also is the nature is really well done. Instead of working on small molecules, more and more pharmaceutical industries show, showed that biologicals uh, are more efficient compared to small molecules. Biologicals is like proteins, peptides, mRNA or antibodies, so coming from humans or human cells. So we know that biologicals seems to be really more efficient. And we will go also to, as we call, personalized medicine. So now in pharmaceutical industries, we work on phenotypic screening in two dimensions. So we, we have one step place, but keeping simple cellular models remain inefficient since we have already 10% of success. When we, can com when we compare phenotypic versus target-based screening, the interesting thing is that we have more for, uh, first in class drugs in phenotypic screening compared to target based screening, meaning that phenotypic screening can be really interesting to find new drugs and new efficient, new efficient drugs with uh, other target that's already uh, tested. But as you can see, we have around 10% uh, of, uh, of, uh, of success uh, for all therapeutic area. In oncology fields, it's only 3% of success in clinical trials. The problem is that 2D cell culture models are not efficient since the cells in the body are in a specific environment that we call the extracellular matrix. So if we want to be more relevant, we need also to recreate the full complexity of, a, of, of the disease, of a tissue, uh, so we need to have the cells embedded in the right extracellular matrix. Uh, the extracellular matrix is made by solid scaffolds, allowing to have the structure of the tissue. And we have also adhesion proteins, allowing the cells to be fixed on these uh, solid scaffolds. And we have also blood vessels that give the, that, uh, give the nutrients and the gas, the gas to, to, the, to the cells. So here in Nash's Pharma, we have a new and disruptive technology called Biomimesis, allowing us to really recreate organ-specific extracellular matrix. And so with this technology, we can really recreate the full complexity of, uh, of a tissue, disease tissue or disease organs, by, by the cells embedded in the pathological environment. In oncology, we can see that we have only 3% of success. That we know is that we are firstly inflammation that can induce activation of fibroblasts and fibroblasts induce uh, a, a secretion of um, uh, solid elements from the extracellular matrix. So finally, with this uh, fibroblast, 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 we have um, uh, an increase of the stiffness of the extracellular matrix, that we call tumoral extracellular matrix. This increase of the stiffness induces mechanical stress on the cells. As a consequence, the cells start to proliferate and change. We have a lot of mutations. So the problem is that the current treatments deal just with the consequence. We, we just look to find treatments that kill cancer root cells. But the big issue is that the tumoral extracellular matrix stay as it is, and finally the cancer restarts. So we have a lot of difficulties to, to deal with this just with the consequence. So I think that we really need to, to deal also 
with the cause that is the modification of the environment around the cells. So to find new treatments and more efficient treatments, we really need to find also treatments that deal with the modification of the environment. And for that, we need 3D in vitro models that is the extracellular matrix in the right, the cells in the extracellular matrix. And so, in HS Pharma, we develop new in vitro organoids, not only the cells in the slide I mentioned, but in the right environments um, with the right extracellular matrix. And we hope, and we have already some results showing that we have 90% of correlation between in vitro results if you have the full complexity of the tissue compared to in vivo uh, on human results. So we really think that we will really increase the drug, the drug research and development efficiency. So the future of the medicine, we can see that instead of working in two dimension, we will go on three dimension. We will do tissue engineering in order to recreate the full complexity of a tissue or an organ. And we will go also on cell therapy, regenerative medicine, and I really think that biomimesis can help to really recreate the full complexity of a tissue. And I will think, I think that this technology can also help to go to rec really recreate the full organ, to go to organ transplantation. So finally, when we can see, we have a simplification of the test before the 20th century. And now we, we complexify the, 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 the tests in order to really test the cells, the test the drugs, as you test drugs in a real human. It's because of that we work in tissue engineers, and after that in human and sheep. So when you can see in the past, until before the 20th century, we start from organs, we analyze the tissues, the cells, the molecules, the atoms. So the fundamental research was the analysis from the macro to, to micro in parallel for the applied research. We have tested in animal models, after that in, uh, in, in in vitro models, especially with target based screening. And, and we work also on small molecules. Now we have three interesting uh, biotechnology uh, uh, models. We have CRISPR-Cas9 to do gene engineering, iPSC to develop, to, 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 to do the cell engineering, and we have biomimesis to do uh, tissue engineering. So now, for the next century, the fundamental research will be how is the regulation between the, the proteins into, into the cells, interaction of the proteins into the cells, after, the, after that, what is the interaction cells between cells, but also cells around the, the environments, and finally the organ communication. So the fundamental research go to the micro, to the, to the micro to micro. In parallel for the applied research, we go to personalized medicine, gene and cell therapy, regenerative medicine, using 3D cellular models, tissue engineered models, going also to human and sheep assays. But how to recreate in which uh, raw organoids and tissue uh, and tissue it's by use by recreate the extracellular matrix and for that we need to know what is the extracellular matrix biomimesis is with a breakthrough technology that exists as the 3d cell culture is without any matrix we have just an aggregation of the cells into a spheroids we have plastic based solid scaffolds with the cells that can do spheroids into the cavities of the plastic. And we have a lot of hydrogel based systems that is totally unstructured, allowing the cells to be just going as spheroid into, into this hydrogel. To recreate the extracellular matrix, we need both. We need a combination of the solid scaffold with adhesion proteins, allowing the cells to be fixed on the solid scaffolds, with a viscous environment for the cells. It's because of that biomimesis is really interesting since it's made by two steps. Chemical cross-linking follow, followed by a physical process in order to have the extracellular matrix as we have in uh, in vivo situation. 
So compared to uh, in extracellular matrix, in vivo extracellular matrix, we have the same behavior with solid scaffold and hydrogel behavior. So for that, we need to know what is the extracellular matrix composition. We know that we have structural elements with different glycosaminoglycans. The first one is the hyaluronic acid. Other structural proteins like collagens. We have different adhesion proteins like fibronectin, laminins. That we know also is depending of the organ, the mechanical properties is different. The, the brain is really a soft organ. The bone is really, is really hard. So the extracellular matrix needs a different stiffness depending of the organ with a really low stiffness for the brain and really high stiffness for the bone. So we need to, to know this kind of information in order to recreate in vitro extracellular matrix. So biomesis, the process is to use the hyaluronic acid where we graft adhesion proteins. We had also other structural proteins like collagens, fibronectin, and so on. We have firstly an hydrogel-based systems chemical emails. After that, we have a physical process to change the state from viscous as hydrogel systems into a solid scaffold that we call hydroscaffold. Since we can tune the composition and we can tune the physical process to have different stiffness of the extracellular matrix, biomimesis is really the first organ-specific extracellular matrix with all physical, chemical and biological properties. So when we have a liver, when we have a target that we want to recreate the extracellular matrix, for example, for the liver, we need to know what is the structural elements, what is the, the adhesion proteins. We need to know the stiffness, and at the end of the process, at the end of the process, we have the organ-specific extracellular matrix. So when you compare on the scanning electron microscopy in vivo extracellular matrix on a deserized organ with biomimesis technology, you can see the same features with interpenetrated network of hyaluronic acid and collagens. So it's really like a sponge, it's really a porous. It's around uh, 100 micrometer uh, of porosity in in vivo extracellular matrix, but we have the same thing on, in biomimesis. So compared to all other 3D cell systems, Biomimesis is really uh, physio physiological uh, 3D cell systems, totally relevant, organ specific, with the both behavior, solid scaffold, cells ad adhesion, but also the viscous environment for the cells. Since we can tune the stiffness, it's the only one that can do the mechanical stress on the cells in a tumor. It's, it's totally industrializable for drug screening, and we don't have any batch to batch uh, discrepancies. And we have already some in vitro in vivo correlation showing that compared to two, two dimension or compared to 3D, uh, 3D um, other cellular system, other 3D cell culture systems. With biomimesis, if you have the right environment for the cells, the, the efficiency, the uh, results are really the same than in humans, that you can show in, in humans for efficacy analysis, but also for adverse effects. So we really think that with this kind of technology, if you recreate the full complexity of a tissue, we can really predict 90% of success in clinical trials by using this kind of uh, tissue engineers with biomimesis. It's because of that we really think that we will dramatically increase the drug research and development efficiency with this technology. And finally, we know that biomimesis can be also be used in biotechnology for all biotechnology for all biotechnology industries. So we use that firstly in drug discovery, but we know that all biotechnology industries using cells face the same problem, the same issues that is the, the cell culture systems. <coughs> with, the, with the current cell culture systems, you have a lot of problems uh, on the cell mass production, on the differentiation, on tissue engineering, due to the fact that you don't have the right environment for the cells. In addition, you use a lot of plastic consumables. You need flasks, you need plates, you need 
tips. Everything is in uh, in uh, in plastic, and plastic is not a good way to for the for the ecology. For bioproduction, we know that we use a lot of 2D cell culture systems, so a lot of plastics. We have different 3D cell systems in order to use that in bioreactors. The first is scaffold free. Another one is a beads graft with hydrogen proteins. Or oh, we have also encapsulation in hydrogel. We have the same issues. We have poor rentability and poor quality of cells after cell amplification. Here, you have the right solid scaffold with adhesion proteins with biomimesis, usable in, in bioreactors. So you can use that uh, in uh, bioproduction in, uh, in bioreactors. And if you use the right environment, the results is higher. You have high rentability and high quality of cells. We have a lot of results showing that for all biotechnology industries, this technology is really interesting since with the, with the right environment for the cells, it's improved all the process for all biotechnology industries. For the cell mass production, for the differentiation of stem cells into a targeted organ, and for tissue engineering. In addition, this technology can really replace the, the, the plastic consumables. So, with biomimesis, it's the first in vitro organ specific SSRI matrix. It's a green chemistry. It's industrializable. It's animal free. It's a microcarrier used for cell mass production in bioreactors that will really suppress all plastic consumables. And by giving the right environment to the cells, biomimesis improves cell mass productivity and cell quality. So biomimesis is really the future for all green biotechnology industries. So thank you for your attention.